let's go ahead and knock this one out. All right. So we have this physical therapist here. All right. Usually I have a name, right? I don't have a name this week. What, what name y'all want? Well, let, let's call him Nate. All right. Nate is evaluating a patient in the acute care setting. The patient has a history of CHF, COPD, atrial fibrillation, hypertension, and fibromyalgia. Upon entering the room, the following image is displayed on the ECG monitor. What is the best course of action? So we got immediately stop the evaluation and call the nurse. We got B, which is assess the patient's blood pressure. C is activate the rapid response. And D is to continue with the evaluation while monitoring the patient's response to activity. All right. So let's go ahead. Start at the top of the order. Start at the top of the question. Nate is evaluating this patient in the acute care setting. All right. So the first sentence really doesn't have much going on, right? There's not much to, to really gather from the beginning of this. I mean, it's important for you to understand and recognize that we are in the acute care setting. And so there's different decisions that are made in the acute care setting when you're a physical therapist. I mean, when you're outpatient, you know, we either have the option to treat our patient or to not treat them. Um, we can call EMS. We can refer them to their physician. Um, those are our options. But in the acute care setting, you have other options, right? You can call the code. You can refer to the uh, physician and, and let the physician know about whatever. Um, you can just contact the nurse. You can terminate treatment. I mean, there's a lot of different decisions. Okay, and so we need to be aware of that. We need to respect that there are some decisions and why we would make those decisions necessary decisions all right so it's really important as we're continuing down this question now it says that the patient has a history of congestive heart failure all right so th that's important right the patient is having that congestive heart failure we know that their heart is unable to meet the demands of the body it's not able to pump out enough blood to meet the demands of the body so that's important uh, patient has copd so they have this obstructive lung condition difficulty getting air out atrial fibrillation so we know that this is a cardiac arrhythmia all right that deals with a quivering of the atria and the reason why that's happening is because they're not getting very good signal from the sa node they're getting all these signals from what we call ectopic foci it's just different areas within the atria that are just sending these electrical signals and so the atria is just like freaking out just freaking all right, we call that fibrillation. All right, atrial fibrillation. Then, so that's important. And then we have hypertension, which is high blood pressure. Everybody's pretty familiar with that. And then uh, fibromyalgia, uh, which we know is a bit of a rheumatic condition uh, where a patient has myalgias, pain, these uh, different uh, tender points um, throughout the body as well. So it's characterized by that. Okay, and also fatigue is a major major player in fibromyalgia. All right, so we have this list of all these different conditions, these comorbidities. And so now upon entering the room, the following image is displayed on the ECG monitor. And so what is our best course of action? All right, so before we go down, start dissecting and dominating this question, you have to, you have to look at the ECG reading. All right, what do we see here? So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you something that I do, y'all. I'm going to tell you something that I do, Thomas, Sarah, Tracy. Great to see y'all tonight. You know what? What I do is I always start on the left side of the ECG or EKG reading, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, and I always start there and I know my, what my waves are. I know that there's a P wave, the QRS and the T wave, and I know what they all stand for. We have to know that first. But when I start off on that left side, the first thing I'm looking for is is my P wave. That's, that's the beginning of, you know, cardiac contraction, right? And so I'm looking here and I do see a P wave. All right. I do see a P wave, um, but it's kind of weird, right? If you really look at this, it's like, I see one, but I, I can't tell if that's like one, if that's two, if that's three, I don't know. It's just bumpy lines all the way across. Then I see a, a, a QRS complex. That's a big peak. That's cool. Then as I move into where I should see my P waves again, my T wave and my P waves, I see just a squiggly line again. There's not a defined P wave there. It's just like a squiggly line. So I'm like, mm, I don't know about that. 
I don't know about that. That's not like a, a very true P wave that precedes the QRS complex. What is that telling me already? Well, it could be a, a AV node block. But no, 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 I am getting a P wave. So um, it's not necessary to say that it's a, an AV node block or second degree or third degree. There's actually a bunch of P waves, it looks like. Well, what's that consistent with? That can either be an atrial flutter or it can be an atrial fibrillation. All right, well, let's continue down the line. As I get up to this point right here, all right, and I'm looking at that, I'm seeing, okay, I definitely see some P waves. Again, it's like a squiggly line. It's not defined at all. And so already that's leading me to believe that, okay, what I'm looking at right now is atrial fibrillation because the one thing about atrial flutter is that it's very consistent. All right, it has these P waves that kind of kind of look like that and they call it a sawtooth pattern and then it has a, a QRS complex and then another sawtooth pattern. And then another, I know my drawing isn't the best, but it's a sawtooth pattern when you're talking about atrial flutter. But atrial fibrillation, it's kind of like erratic all over the place. We got a bunch of P waves just popping up. So what am I really seeing here? I'm not seeing a PVC. I'm seeing atrial fibrillation on this ECG. All right. And now that I, I have an understanding of what's going on in this ECG reading, I need to determine, well, what is the best course of action given this clinical picture? So let's go down and start dissecting the answer choices. So we have A, immediately stop the evaluation and call the nurse. All right, so this is a good one. I like these questions right here, baby. <laughs> and the reason why I like them is because it's like, ooh, do I stop the eval and call the nurse? My question to you is, well, why would we stop the eval? What is our purpose? Why are we doing that? So here's the deal. Atrial fibrillation is, is, is actually a pretty common condition for an elderly person who has congestive heart failure, all right, who has these cardiac issues. So atrial fibrillation is not an emergent condition, all right? And the fact that the patient had atrial fibrillation previously and now they're presenting with atrial fibrillation on their ECG, well, they have atrial fibrillation. I, that's what I expect to see. So immediately stop the eval. I would not do that. I mean, if this was uh, the, the first time this patient had ever showed up with atrial fib, then I'd be like, all right, hold on a minute. We need to see what's going on. We need to stop. All right. But right now, the patient's had a history of atrial fib. I'm seeing it on the ECG. Why stop the eval? Why contact the nurse? There's just not a definitive reason as to why I would do that. I don't like A. I don't think that that's the best course of action at this point. All right, let's look at B. B says to assess the patient's blood pressure. Well, when I look at the ECG again, it's like, well, what? This is a decision-making process now. Why would I want to check the patient's blood pressure? Like, what makes me want to, to do that as my next step? Well, atrial fibrillation, I mean, it can impact blood pressure, but, I, you know, that's not, that's not my next best course of action. That's not my best course of action right now is just to check the blood, patient's blood pressure. There's nothing that that information is really going to help me with at this point regarding the ECG reading. The patient's blood pressure, I mean, it's important, but it's just not important for this specific question, the way it's worded. Okay, and so B, I don't like it. Would I want to check the patient's blood pressure? Of course, it's a right answer. I would love to check the patient's blood pressure. It's just not the best course of action, something I would really want to do given this information here. Does that make sense to y'all? Let me know if that makes sense. All right, I want to eliminate B though. Let's go down to C. C is to activate the god darn rapid response, baby. That's the press that dang blue button, red button. Let everybody know that this patient is coding, that the patient is dying on you. Um, the patient is at immediate danger. All right. So I don't like this. I don't like to activate the rapid response because the ECG is not, it's not telling us anything that's like an emergent condition right now. Again, atrial fibrillation, the patient's had it before. They're showing up on the ECG monitor with it, which is to be expected. All right. 
you know, the only time I would really be like very, very concerned is if this patient was at rest and their uh, what they call the ventricular response rate. All right. Actually, really, the heart rate is way above like 100. All right. Because the heart rate shouldn't be above 100 if the patient has atrial fibrillation and they're at rest. OK, that's a problem. That means that it's uncontrolled atrial fibrillation. And that's not what I'm seeing here. Even then, I still wouldn't activate the rapid response. Now, if I was seeing something like major, like, oh, patients have an ST segment elevation and they're having other signs and symptoms that are consistent with a myocardial infarction, um, you know, the patient passed out on you, something along the lines of that, then yes, that is ground for C. I would, I would, I would definitely go down that route of activating the rapid response, okay? But in this situation, no, that is overkill. The people are going to be yelling at you when they rush in the room and they see that the patient just has atrial fib and they've been having that. All right. So don't don't get fired. C is not the right answer here. D. Let's take a look at it. Might not be the right answer. Let's make sure it's the best one. So it says continue with the evaluation while monitoring the patient's response to the activity. And I like this. I like this answer because can we continue with the evaluation? Yes, the patient's in no immediate danger. The patient has a history of atrial fib. We're seeing atrial fib on the ECG. Okay, let's continue. But we do need to monitor their response to activity. At the very, very, very minimum, we need to make sure that we're at least uh, monitoring their response to activity to make sure that this atrial fibrillation doesn't turn into or progress into anything else that's more severe. More severe could be ventricular fibrillation. All right, we wouldn't want that because that rapidly leads to ventricular or, or we should say asystole where there's actually no contraction at all. Okay, so your final answer here is D, to continue with the evaluation while monitoring the patient's response to activity. It's the best, best route to take. All right, for those of you who got this question correct, congratulations. Y'all dominated, baby. I'm super excited about it. For those of you who didn't, now you get a, a bit better understanding of how atrial fibrillation will come off on an ECG. All right. Um, what you need to do if you have a patient who has a history of atrial fib and they're presenting with atrial fib today on the ECG, you have a better understanding of what is the next steps that you need to take. As always, if you got this answer correct, maybe you selected to go with A. A is a very popular answer with this type of question to immediately stop. More than likely, you're, we're not understanding what's really happening on the ECG. And even if you are understanding it and you see that the patient has atrial fib, do you know what the right decision-making process is when your patient has atrial fib? That's super important information. All right, you get that information from Ellen Hillegas's book. Um, that's a cardiopulmonary uh, book that the MPT references for the answers. Uh, definitely check that out. It's implications for PTs um, and, and it's cardiopulmonary. All right, physical therapy. Cool. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, definitely reach out. Let me know. Um, is always, you know, there's different ways. It doesn't always have to be a knowledge or application related problem that causes you to miss a question like this one. All right. You can easily use really good test taking strategies, strategies that help you to pick out certain parts of the question that guide you to the right answer. In this question right here, there are some major keys that you can look at that kind of guide you to the fact that A, B and C are just not the right answer. And D is it. But you have to have that cohesive test taking strategy. If you are someone who's going into your questions, kind of looking up and down the question, bouncing all over, you know, getting down to those final two answers, like, oh, it might be A, might be D. Something's pulling me to A, though. I, I just, oh, I'm just, I, okay, all right, I'll just select A. I, I'm out of time. I just select A. And you get the question wrong. If that is you, you are, you don't have a test taking strategy. You need to come see me at destroy the mpte.com. Let me get you right. Let me teach you the strategies to help you dominate your test this coming January 2019. Yep. <laughs>